Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we get started i have a quick favor i've been self-funding the finding genius podcast for five years now i've done over three thousand episodes and as you can see on youtube we're up over a million views on the channel which is fantastic the next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers, because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button, and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running, and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems, uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Charles Dowding. He's the author of a book called No Dig, Nurture Your Soil to Get Grow Better Veg with Less Effort. So we're going to talk about uh, his book, and composting and uh, planting vegetables. And Charles has a uh, pretty popular uh, YouTube channel that we'll get into as well. So, Charles, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure, Rich. I'm looking forward to a chat. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get interested in growing vegetables and composting? I was uh, way back when I was at university, actually, and I, I became a vegetarian after reading a, a, a book about that uh, cruelty to animals, actually. <laughs> I grew up on a farm, so I've seen all sides of, of that. And, yeah, it just felt right to me to to live off food directly from the land and I, then I, that made me want to grow it and then I got interested in health and that led me to being an organic grower which then led me to look into the soil and I realized that soil was really being really badly treated and people weren't really questioning that aspect of it at all so that that's how I stumbled really on, on what I'm doing now and that was 40 years ago 
and it's been quite a journey of, of doing it without always knowing what I'm doing, but I'm getting clearer all the time. Wow, so you've been growing your own vegetables and, and doing this farming on your own for 40 years? Yeah, I became an, cool. a market grower at the age of 22, and um, yeah, I've just stuck at it. <laughs> so what kinds of interesting things have you worked on during the years? You know, what super interesting learnings that have jumped out at you? I know it's a very vague question, but yeah. you know, what would you like to start with in terms of um, you know, what you want to communicate to people that are interested in growing their own food? Well, something that grabbed me really early on was that link between soil health and people health, something that wasn't being much discussed in the 1980s, although it had been earlier on. Ironically, it's funny how things come around. You know, the, that old saying, there's nothing new under the sun, uh, is because things get forgotten and they get rediscovered. And hopefully each time you rediscover, <laughs> you learn a bit more about it. And recently there's been a strong renaissance of interest in soil and particularly in the biology of soil. And that's what people were looking at way back in the 1930s and 40s. And they were interested in soil fungi. And there was this guy, Albert Howard in India, who was making amazing compost. And he realized that compost was not about the chemical nutrients it contained, the so-called plant food, but it was about the soil stimulation it could give through the fungal quality. And that, that made sense to me. And then I came across books written in the 1980s by scientists, which I'd say with an inverted comma, who said that there's no link between growing vegetables and the life in the soil that vegetables do not use <laughs> soil biology. And, you know, so that was there in black and white in the book. And that really discouraged me, actually. But I thought, I can't be right. Anyway, I just thought about it a bit. And I just got on with what I'm doing. And it's only quite recently that, you know, my original thoughts have, have, have had a bit of backup. And, and I've been encouraged to look into it much, much more with, with help from, you know, there's now amazing research going on. People like Elaine Ingham, I often mention her. She's a great soil microbiologist in Oregon and, and so on. So th there's now a network of people doing this. And the other big difference now is that we have the Internet. And the, the, like us this evening, this is such a great way to share knowledge. And previously, that wasn't there. And so knowledge could be filtered. And, you know, I've become a bit like what some people would call a conspiracy theorist. But it's not that at all. It's about actually just embracing new knowledge and and there's there's a, a strong interest in the the establishment to block it to be you know to put it bluntly and um magazine editors newspaper editors controlled by big media corporations they they only allow a certain amount of this stuff to come out you know they, they don't want to rock the boat too much so the, the, with the internet you you can go the whole hog and, and discuss things and show people things well you couldn't until recently anyway and i've really enjoyed connecting with a lot of people all over the world through the internet youtube instagram and so on and, and being able to, you know, build what you might call a movement even, you know, about no dig, which is a very simple thing. It's about just leaving the soil alone, allowing nature to do what it knows best and grow a super healthy food. And the benefits are cumulative and even that health, you know, I'm not only talking about nutrition in terms of the old fashioned definition of protein, carbohydrate and fat, you know, which is such a narrow uh, way of looking at it. But the, the biology as well, and, that, and that's what links to Nodig again, because you, you're really encouraging the biology of the soil, the microbes, and now even scientists, nutritionists are realizing, hang on a minute, <laughs> we've forgotten that bit, the, you know, what's going oh, on. Qu question, the yeah, question here, um, you talk yeah. about no dig. What, what does that look like? Let's say um, okay. I'm going to do a garden at my house. Do I, yeah. you know, I, I'm supposed to like poke holes and put the seeds in, like let's say an inch or two, right? Or what, what does no dig mean? versus okay. the previous method. It means exactly what it says on the tin. So you you disturb your soil. Well, actually, to be precise, you disturb your soil, dig it, or whatever it might be, as little as possible. Sometimes you need to, say, dig a hole to plant a tree. I'm quite often asked that on YouTube, you know, so, hey, with no dig, how do you plant a tree? <laughs> actually, I recently I put up a little video about how to plant a potato with no dig, and what I do is I put a trowel in the soil and just pull it towards me and drop the seed potato in this kind of slit I've made. And uh, it turns out in, in your language in the States, a, a tr what we call a trowel, which is just a small hand tool, is called a shovel. I think it is anyway. So people are saying, hey, he's talking about no digging. He's holding a shovel and he's digging the soil. But, you know, that's what I mean. It's like sometimes you've got to disturb the soil a bit. But essentially with no dig, you're, you know, just leaving it alone. And, and that allows the existing soil network, which you can't see, uh, to do its work. And then the, the, the second part, so the first part is doing as little as possible. And the second part is doing 
a lot to feed the soil life, which is there all the time. And it, it feeds on both soil um, organic matter, which could, I, for, for our climate here, which is quite damp, I recommend to be compost in dry climates. It might be hay or straw, less decomposed material or wood chips and other possibility, but only a small amount. So you're putting that on top and the soil life is kind of geared up to, re, to for the food to arrive on the surface, how, how it works in nature. So they come up to the surface and feed on it. Things like worms, centipedes, spiders, goodness knows what else that lives in the soil. And then that builds up a, a whole life in the soil, which helps to feed the plants through the networks of fungi, for example, the mycorrhizal network that's already there. And if you if you ever dig or till the soil, you're going to break all that possibility of, of the, all this working for you and with you. So oh, it, in the U.S. here, I think they call it no till. Yes, exactly. I guess it's it's. So your method Sorry. is, yes, disturb the soil and plant, but as little as possible versus people that dig a big old hole and yeah. put the, you know, mix the dirt themselves. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. You've got it. I mean, it's really simple. It's just sometimes words can, can be confusing. And so that's why one ends up using quite a few words to explain what's really a very simple process. Um, there's one slightly more complicated aspect, though, of no dig, no till, which is how do you get rid of the weeds or whatever's growing in, in, in when you arrive at a new plot of ground? So, and for that, there is a bit of a procedure. And uh, you can either use a big sheet of black plastic, for example, or I, for smaller areas, I'd recommend using cardboard on top of the weeds. Then you put some compost or well decomposed organic matter of any kind on top of the cardboard and you can plant into that straight away. You haven't got to wait for anything to happen, even while the weeds are dying in the darkness underneath. So it's just little bits of knowledge like that really help the process to go smoothly. Wait, so what would it look like? So I, w- I have a, oh, cool. an area I want to plant that's covered in weeds. I put oh. down plastic everywhere except where I want to plant, or how does it, <laughs> how do I literally do it? Right. So if it's covered in weeds, just to be clear, that's a really good sign. That shows if they're growing strongly, you've got nice fertility there. You've got a good structure in your soil. They will have sucked out at this. If, if you're doing it in the summer, particularly, they will have sucked out a lot of moisture. You might need to water a bit before you put down cardboard. I would recommend if, if we're talking a small area, say small could be or oh, less. 10 feet by 20 feet or something like that. that that could be small if you're doing a bigger area then the black plastic could be useful but basically what the principle of it to, to understand is that you want no light to reach the weeds that are growing and then they die in darkness no plant can survive for very long in darkness so that's what you're doing you're depriving them of light they die underneath whatever you put on top the light excluding cover and then what it will look like well you'll you're going to get a hold of you need to buy this is the one big initial investment buy some compost which could also be well watered manure lots of, you know anything decomposed basically put that on top and that's what you're going to plant into so your plot will look like compost basically look quite dark and rich and you, it looks like you've improved your soil massively very quickly <laughs> and i'd recommend maybe you have some beds maybe four foot three or four foot wide and then you have pathways not too wide maybe 15 inches um, you could put also cardboard mulch them so you don't want weeds in your paths either uh, maybe then put a bit of wood chip on the path not too much uh, and you've got your whole ground covered then you, you you've taken care of most of the weeds at least initially and you can crack on with your your growing so what, what about if um so what the, the the weeds are weakened i mean as soon as you take the plastic away <laughs> I guess I would think they would they would start to come back, but now your main plant has had a head start. Or what happens with the plastic? Good, yeah, you're on the ball there. Well, you've got two options. You could, if you, especially if you put the plastic down at the beginning of summer, say, you can make little holes in it and put in plants. You can leave it there while your plants, like say squash, zucchini, that kind of thing, or it could even be big um, brassicas for autumn and winter, like broccoli or cabbage or things. 
um, they, they can root into the ground below the plastic. The plastic um, can stay there while the, again while the weeds are dying. So if you've got at least if you can work out whether you've got really strong weeds with a strong root system uh, like Bermuda grass or something like that, then then I would leave the plastic there and plant through it. Uh, but otherwise, if you use the cardboard and compost, you will get some of these perennial weeds, they're called the persistent ones, growing up through. And you need to keep pulling them until their parent root gives up because no weed is invincible. Well, I've had some discussions about this. Um, I think with people who haven't been persistent enough themselves and they kind of lost it, which fair enough, I totally get that. But if you can manage to keep on it, I've also had nice feedback from people who've got rid of Bermuda, Bermuda grass, for example, using this method, and they've been quite surprised themselves. But it is possible, but you've got to keep at it in that first year or so, first summer. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, what if you, um, you have weeds in a certain area and you, you cut them, and you chop them up, and then you just throw them back onto the soil? Would that help actually give nutrients back to the soil and act as food for your main plant, or is it is it better to just no, throw them away or away? No, no, you, you I could absolutely do that, uh, just especially in dry climates. Here here we're always a bit careful. In, in I'm in the UK, it's quite damp often, and the rotting matter on top of the soil can can encourage slugs to come along, and, and the, if you get too high a population of them, that can they can eat your plants. But in drier climates, that's a very good plan. But again, I would wet wet the all material before you put your plastic or cardboard on to make sure it's moist underneath and then you're starting from a good place and your your living organisms can get busy i've heard that uh it's a good idea to plant cover crops sometimes cover plants especially nitrogen fixers near your plant that you're growing um would that work or is it better to just cover them and get rid of them that's a really interesting question because for me cover crops are more a feature of no-till farming, as I would call it, which is scaling up into growing what in the UK we call field crops, such as wheat and barley and maize, uh, corn and potatoes even, where you, you have larger areas of ground and you're cropping with machines and, and all the calculations change compared to when you are what I would call gardening. That's what I'm doing. That's intensive cropping for growing vegetables. Just to give you the background to that, I'm cropping only one third of an acre. I'm selling a lot of vegetables from that and I'm double cropping most of my beds, which means that we we plant up in, in March, in early spring. A lot of harvests happen in May, June and July and we immediately clear those beds and replant. And there's no time for cover crops. There's no space. We're putting vegetables in really close. So it's not really relevant. And yet that's causing confusion because it's been a bit of a one-size-fits-all discussion from what I've seen. And you know, when, when we talk generally about cover crops, it's a great principle. Having something leaves over the ground, roots in the ground. During all the growing season, I don't see much value in it during the winter when most soil and soil microbes are, are dormant. So basically my cover crops, if you like, are vegetables. Uh, that's how I look at it. I want food from my land. I don't want you know plants that are not uh, going to be um, edible and and then you got the you'd have the cost of seeding and you'd have the cost of working out how to clear them before you can re-sow and replant so it's a great principle and suitable more for larger fields oh so you haven't seen any weeds that are complementary to what you want to grow they're only detrimental yeah pretty much i mean there's just one or two exceptions like for example if we've got a bit of ground that comes empty without any vegetables on it anymore because we take a last harvest say in october to early november which for us is just on the cusp before we go into winter um we can sow or transplant broad beans what i think you call fava beans and they grow slowly over the winter they're one of the few plants that do and we can even harvest the bean tops they're nice to eat and they do fix the nitrogen and then we cut them at ground level in say april may before we replant late plantings in the spring normally that's just one example but mostly it doesn't really fit into the system of what i'm doing um and my beds my ground is covered but it's covered with compost and wood chip that we put on the pathways uh, rather than living plants in the winter time when it's pretty dormant here yeah i guess like that's called mulch right yeah I'm mulch. <laughs> yeah you got it yeah absolutely so, you know again elementary question but for people that don't know 
Hmm. When should you cover with compost or, and or mulch? And what does it do you know, during the spring and summer versus the winter or the fall and winter? What's, does it okay. play a different role? Yeah. I mean, any time is possible. And if you're just starting out making, taking a new ground, putting on new mulch compost to cover your, your ground, you can do that spring, summer, fall and winter. But if you've got an up and running space that's already cropping and like I say, you're cropping it intensively through through the growing season, then it's 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 late fall normally that you'd be putting down your mulch and that protects and covers the ground over winter when you're not growing any food anymore until the following spring. And it's feeding the soil life, which even during winter months can be uh, doing a little bit of eating, eating and excreting. That's what's going on in the soil. And that's happening underneath your mulch. So it's good to put it on in, in the late fall, for example. Once a year, just once a year, even if you're double crossing. Okay. So are you um are you trying to grow things all year round? Like during the winter, are you growing these fava beans and you know, the few plants that do grow? Or do you but, leave your soil over the winter? We, we, yeah, we're not doing any sowing for winter after early fall, you know, that because to get you to get actually get harvest in the winter, you've got to get they get their, they've got to get their roots in the ground long before so that they can give you some either new growth or to have the ability to give you a harvest in winter. And that would be things like leeks or kale, uh, some winter salads, and even maybe beetroot. Some of the root vegetables can be pretty hardy, um, Sweden turnip, rutabaga. But they, they need sowing in the summer, a lot of those. So in the, in the winter months, even in the fall, we're not sowing much for the winter. So it's the residue of what, what we'd already grown that we're harvesting through the winter. And then we also get some plants growing like garlic you can put in the ground sort of mid-fall. And uh, spring cabbage, maybe, you know, same story. So that way you have plants early in the following spring. So we've got some plants growing in the winter, but I reckon about one third of my ground is has got growing plants in over winter and two thirds is beds empty, but covered with the mulch. What's the purpose of mulch, especially over the fall and winter? It's too... It's residual. Yeah, the mulch through fall and winter is about uh, protecting soil from weather. But more than anything, it's about... Well, protecting the soil life, I should say. So all the organisms that are in the soil, uh, they go semi-dormant in winter, a lot of them, but some of them carry on feeding, depending on your temperature and where you are. Uh, like earthworms could, could be coming up to the surface um, in mild weather and, and looking for food. And if there's a bit of compost there, they'll be very grateful for that. So it, it keeps the soil um, potentially alive and, and really ready for spring. And also the, because the mulch is in place before winter, then the winter weather helps to break up any lumps and make it soft and smooth. And in the spring, it's really easy then uh, with a light raking to sow your seeds or put in your transplants. And in very early spring, you've got a lovely surface. It's ready to go at any point. That's one beautiful aspect of no dig, no till. You, you haven't got any preparation work to do or hardly any, you know, it's just mulching and then looking after your mulch, but that's very quick. And, and you're just ready to go at any time. And one other beautiful benefit I'll mention is <clears throat> if you're on heavy soil, and you're used to tilling in the spring, you'll often get muddy boots, a real pain. <laughs> and with this method, no, no, you, you don't, because you've just got the surface mulch on top, the compost and a bit of wood chipping pathways, and, and it doesn't stick to your boots. And you can go at any time, even in wet weather, and get on with your, your jobs. And so it's another way to get early cropping in the spring. Yeah. What, what kind of mistakes do you see new or novice um, planters make that you can tell them to avoid? Maybe, oh, I can think of a few, possibly expecting too much, especially if people have seen photos of my garden. You know, I've got a lot of experience. I've been building up the fertility here for quite a while. You may not get the initial abundance uh, that, that you, you've seen at homemakers say, but having said that, don't set the bar too low. And uh, But be, the mistake, I think, more than anything, if you're starting with weedy ground, some people imagine um, that all the weeds are going to die immediately <laughs> under the mulch and, and that they're not reacting enough to removing, pulling out the regrowth of those strong perennial weed plants, which keep growing for a while. And I know that can be discouraging, but just hang in there. If that happens to you, be persistent, do it every week. And then suddenly towards the end of summer or before, you'll notice they're suddenly not growing. Their parent roots have died in place. So you said you build up the fertility of your soil over time. Um, you know, if someone lives in a house somewhere and again, they want to have a, a backyard garden, um, what can they expect the first year 
versus the second year and subsequent years if they well, do things the right way. Yeah. If you can get enough compost, uh, organic matter on top of your soil, like six inches, you can expect really good harvest in the first year. If you use less, it'll be proportionately lower amount, but still good. Uh, but as you go forward, so if you keep putting on, we put on about an inch of new compost once a year in the autumn, autumn or fall, and that maintains fertility. And it, it, soil life seems to encourage grow all the time. So you can expect things to improve. And the, the main difference will be weed growth will diminish, and it, it, it's definitely easier in year two and onwards. And so year one is about often investing some time to get rid of those weeds by repeat pulling. And, and then you can enjoy it more. Um, I mean, you enjoy it all the time, but it becomes a very smooth process. And, you know, I get lovely feedback from all around the world in very different climates from Sao Paulo to Nepal, um, cold and hot and wet and dry. This method, which is also a principle, if you like, you know, this understanding applies right across the world in, in all situations. There are some details you need to adjust the types of mulch you use, that kind of thing. So it's, it's fascinating. I've really enjoyed the feedback on YouTube and the conversations I have there, you know, about how, how yeah. people like this in India or in Alaska or whatever. How much land or how many plants are needed to feed, let's say, one person, at least the vegetable part of their diet? Or, you know, if you're a vegetarian, I guess the whole part. But uh, do you yeah, have any calculations uh, like uh, the ballpark ones? Okay, if you're talking whole part, depends a bit, obviously, how much you eat and everything. But average person it's not that much put it this way i i've got i've got a bed out there where i measure the yield every year and it's five feet wide 16 feet long you know i think most people could relate to that measurement of size that bed gives every year over 10 years the average is over 220 pounds of kitchen ready produce so that's trimmed and ready to cook and that includes onions carrots beetroot potatoes leeks and then a lot of salad plants, lettuce, endive chicory, um, herbs, coriander, dill, and quite a range of food. And that's cropping from April to um, December. And then some of that could be stored like potatoes. I warmly recommend potatoes as a staple crop because I'm finding here you can sow them in April. You don't need to put them in the ground too early. Please, they're called that particular type of potato. They mature more quickly. Then you've got time to put something else in the ground. So you're getting more from your space. And those potatoes store really well. You just keep them in a sack, make sure they're dry in the darkness. And we, we're still eating them even the following May or June. So, you know, those kinds of things really enhance your productivity, looking after the storage side of things. I think it's up to anyone really to work it from there. But if you took it, the, I reckon six or eight of the beds that i quoted so that would be um 40 feet by we'll say 40 feet by 20 feet probably doesn't sound a huge area and it's not huge actually but you know it's all about looking after a smaller piece of ground and cropping it really intensively not leaving the ground empty at any time you know go back to the thing we were saying about cover crops it's the same principle soil biology wants roots there it wants to be active and plants themselves also like proximity you know that's one version or definition if you like of that phrase that you often hear which companion planting and is often i think mistakenly taken to mean that some plants don't like other plants or some plants would like other plants more i think it's more that all plants like companions they like companionship they like being close to each other so within reason of course you you can put plants in quite a bit closer than maybe is often thought and get a lot from your piece of ground so you know there's all how, those how do you know that um how do you know that they like companion plants what tells you that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I've tried a lot of the classical versions of companion planting, like carrots, like onions, that kind of thing. And I, I've not noticed that it makes a huge difference. And I've also tried a lot of the classical no-nos, like everyone seems to think that bulb fennel, Florence fennel doesn't like other plants. And I'm often using it as an intercrop or interplant with other vegetables very close. It works really well. Uh, so I'm just packing in plants as, plants as close as possible. And, and finding that it works. Is that what you meant? Sorry, I wasn't too sure. Yeah, well, well, so it allows you to plant the plants closer, but is there a hmm. benefit from having, you know, I don't know, a whole bunch of the same plant in the same area? So are you creating like little monocultures or ah, yes. are you into mingling? And, and again, what's the purpose? Like yeah. what, okay, the that... plant has a bunch of other plants right near it. What does that do for it? Uh, well, I'll tell you one benefit of having some plants together not a huge amount but enough 
say, say you're growing cabbages, and uh, cabbages are very prone to uh, butterflies laying on their eggs, and then you've got the worms or caterpillars eating them. And so, especially in the summer with cabbages and kale and broccoli, uh, when I put those plants in the ground, I cover them with something to keep the insects out for at least six weeks. And that's a lot easier if you've got all your cabbages or all your broccoli, whatever it is, all in one bed together. So that's an example where you don't want to have maybe too much diversity. But there's other times where towards the middle end of summer and you're looking for you've got things you want to plant, you've got no more space and you can put plants in with other plants. Then that is kind of polycropping, it's called or whatever. And, and that way, that's in that way, it's good to mix up. And what I've noticed is the, the mixing thing. I, I'm sure that the plants do like that within reason because they, they seem to benefit. They, they, each root maybe has something to say to other roots and, and helps it along a bit. And you've got what are called nurse plants, and um, which is you put a little seedling in next to a plant that's maybe going to finish quite soon in a month. Like I put my fennel near to the cucumbers in August. Cucumbers will finish in September, uh, but they almost seem to help the fennel to get established. Yes, that kind of thing. I don't know for sure, but it just looks like that. And it's lovely. It's a lovely way of working with nature in gardening. You you can be creative like that. I'd urge any of your listeners to try a few things that, you know, base it on what you want to grow and when you want to grow it and just try it. Okay. And then just a couple of words about composting. What's, um, yeah. you know, what's like a good and easy way to create your own compost? Okay. I would say don't don't worry too much about what you may read. It can be made to sound really complicated. It's actually very simple. A compost heat doesn't have to get hot to be successful. It will just take longer. If you do get heat, that will come from adding a lot of material in a fairly short space of time and providing roughly at least half of that material is fairly fresh green matter, which could be fresh leaves. It could even be fresh horse manure, actually, it could even be ground coffee. Things that have quite a bit of nitrogen, it could even be your poo, to be honest. You know, there's loads of stuff out there which will kind of activate and get your compost heap going faster. Uh, but if you haven't got a lot of that, then you'll just get a slower result and it will still be good. It just take longer. Um, so you're basically assembling a decent balance of what's called green and brown materials. Brown would be uh, woody prunings, that kind of thing, paper, cardboard. Uh, stuff that comes from trees originally uh, soil as well is a brown so in the summer months if you're hearing this in the summer i'd encourage you to get out there and get on with it as much as possible because you can make great compost very quickly this and scrounge other people's waste that's another one you know if you've got a small uh, a backyard in, in, in a, a suburban area and not much space but there's probably lots of waste areas nearby where you could go and cut some material or gather it or or tree leaves or whatever it might be and, and just get as much material as possible together. Cut it in small pieces. That's important. Uh, water it if it's dry, uh, but you don't need to water if it's moist. Uh, so there's a bit of practice involved and, and have a go. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to try and, and you will learn by doing it. Well, what are some ways that compost goes wrong? I've seen somewhere, <laughs> you know, mold grows in it. Or like, How do you know the compost is still on the right track versus no good anymore? Yeah, well... What does that mean? You know, goes wrong. I think some of the problem is that people have got overwrought by the complications they've heard, the complicated methods they've heard, and it's made them think it's got to be kind of perfect and it's got to all happen in a very particular period of time. And so don't beat yourself up if, if it looks like it's going slowly. Don't beat yourself up if it's, maybe you think nothing's happening. Maybe more's happening than you think it is. Have a look. So get in there with a fork. A good investment to make is what we call a manure fork. I don't know what it's called in the States, but it's basically a fork with long, thin prongs, slightly curved. And it's much lighter and easier to handle than what's called a digging fork. And put that in and, and just lift up, have a look. And it might might be steaming a bit. Well, that's great. You've got a bit of heat. Or it might be all fibrous and, and not much going on. Perhaps that's because you should have chopped it smaller. Uh, you know, those kinds of things you'll learn. But if it's left in the heat long enough and it's reasonably moist, it will turn into compost eventually. And, and it doesn't have to look perfect. That's probably the most important thing to say. I think people set the bar too high. So even if it's if it's looking dark but not totally decomposed, uh, use it, spread it on the ground. That that will do your soil life great. They'll be really grateful for that, and it won't look perfect, but you're on the way. And then and learn each time how you can make it better. But when should you not use it? When does it look like I screw this up? Too much moisture, or too little air, or whatever it may be, and it's no good. How could you tell? Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use those terms, Rich. I I would say 
it's always good, but you know, it's never going to be. Well, not never. <laughs> it's unlikely to be ever perfect. Whatever you define perfect as, uh, getting it on the ground is often the best answer if it has not turned into something you really like. If it's smelly, uh, like swamp, <laughs> that can happen if it's too wet. And that's happened to me, and that's how I've learned. And um, I, I found the best remedy for that is put it on the ground, uh, where the air can then get at it, it sweetens, and then it becomes something that soil life can eat. So that's why I'm saying, you know, just don't expect it to be wonderful necessarily every time, but use it, get it on the ground, and then start again. That's probably the best remedy. Uh, that you, you know, you're struggling with old material. It's lost its sort of activation ability. It will do better on the soil. Oh, so even if like you do something and, and mold grows in it, just break yeah, it up yeah. and then put it on the soil, it's okay? Mold is great. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, I think people worry about that one too, you know, because fungi, any kind of molds, those kinds of microbes, they're brilliant. They're all part of soil health. They're ultimately part of our health as well. We want that. You know, we don't want a sterile soil and um, lifeless conditions. So um, rejoice with any kind of um, mushroom toadstool kind of thing that grows in, in or around your soil or in your compost heaps. Um, that, that's a fantastic sign of activity, basically. And, and they change all the time, you know. And so if you watch closely in damp weather, you'll see different in healthy soil. You get you get different mushrooms coming up at different times because different fungi are becoming dominant at different times and doing different things. And they all do different parts of the whole breakdown process. It's fascinating when you know a bit about it. And, you know, that's a whole nother, new thing to explore. Have a go. Well, that's good to know. Huh. <laughs> um, what about um, mycorrhizae? You know, like I, I, I remember being in a gardening store and they had like this brown liquid that had supposedly tons of fungus in it. You put some on the on the plants. It really seemed to help them grow much faster. Um, okay. How do you encourage that fungal action, the good fungal action that you want in your planting beds? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Two points there, I'd say. One is the mycorrhizal stuff you might buy is mainly valuable if sterile soil, because if you've got a decent soil with what I would call normal soil life. You don't need products like that. You can save your money. I would, you'd do better to buy some compost, actually, which would feed your existing mycorrhizal life. Mycorrhizae are native to the area wherever they are, and it's not always possible to, to buy them. I mean, you, you were lucky, you were fortunate, great that it worked for you, but I don't think it always does. And so I'd encourage more. You know, you, you build up your mycorrhizal life through through no dig initially, not no till, not not disturbing the ground and and then with organic matter on the surface you know it will happen a lot of this is is trust and that's a very empowering thing because you're learning to work with nature and not always feel that you have to provide the solution you know that's a very analytic rational way of looking at it which serves for certain purposes but in nature and soil natural processes we still don't understand a lot what's going on in the soil you know amazing as it might seem it's right under our feet all the time we're not totally cognizant of all those processes. And often the best thing to do is to do less and, and allow those processes to, to sort themselves out, which they're very good at doing. And so, you know, not, don't use too many products, but just make sure you keep them fed and not disturbed. That's the essence of, of no dig. Okay. Well, very good, Charles. I don't, I don't want to, you know, ask you every question under the sun because I know you have a good YouTube channel with a lot of info. So uh, please tell listeners, where can they find you? What's the name of the channel? And do you have a website? Yeah, uh, my channel is simply my name, Charles Dowding. And my website is also my name. <laughs> it keeps it simple, charlesdowding.co.uk. And, yeah, there is tons of information there. Like on the website, we've got pages on how to make compost, on how to deal with weeds, on what to sow when, seeds and varieties, you name it, it's all there. And likewise on the YouTube channel. I, I hope you'll enjoy it because there's, there's videos that cover Use the search bar, you'll find a lot. Yeah, one last question. You know, there is a lot of talk of food shortages coming and, and problems. Um, what's it, it, Even if someone's, I don't know, not convinced or ultra lazy, what, what's the least that they could do to get themselves going somehow? You know, someone that's like a total beginner or someone that's afraid or, again, they're lazy. or what, What's this? How do you dip your toe in? Well, I think I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think that we're, we're in tumultuous times coming up. So be prepared as much as you can. And, and I think just that thought hopefully would make you not too lazy because <laughs> we all need to uh, do what we can. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, I would urge you to do the things I've described. Um, you know, get hold of some compost while you still can. Create some beds, make, make a growing space. Uh, watch out for pests. Check, check out some of my videos on that, you know, because it's no good growing stuff if, if the pests are going to eat it. So you've got to get clued up on that. But so and plant as much as you can, even now, depending when you hear this, but in, in early summer, you can could still be sowing beetroot and carrots and, and, you know, lots of things that can feed you through the winter, for example. And, and get, get clued up on all of that and do it. Just do as much as you can. And, and you'll enjoy that process. You will also feel healthier. I mean, I haven't said too much about microbes, but that whole thing of soil microbes feeding ultimately your brain, feed your, your well-being. And when you start to feel better and stronger in your brain, you, that, that makes you less lazy. <laughs> if you, like, you know, then, then you really start to see connections. You want to get on with it. So, yeah, have a go. It makes a lot of sense. Charles, thanks so much for coming. You've had a ton of great advice, and, and I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Pleasure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.